Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Zephaniah chapters 1 and 2. And of course, the book of Zephaniah, like much of the other prophets, is about judgment. This time, Zephaniah focuses especially on global judgment. And this does detail the Lord's judgment of Judah and various surrounding nations due to their sin. This judgment will occur in the future day of the Lord, although there are some judgments preceding that especially as that would occur in Zephaniah's future, but our past. Um, and there's a promise as well of restoration after. We always see this with the prophecies. Uh, all the prophets, there's judgment, but there's also promise of restoration. Uh, Zephaniah's name means Yahweh hides or he whom Yahweh hides. And he ministered from 635 to 625 BC, serving as a prophet during some of the same years that Jeremiah did. And he served about a half century after Nahum. Now, Zephaniah is unique among the prophets in two major ways. First, when you see verse 1 in his ancestry, it's listed back to four previous generations. That was not usual. This would indicate a special prominence of Zephaniah among the prophets. Perhaps it has to do with the other unique aspect about him. He was of royal blood. His great-great-grandpa was the godly king Hezekiah of Judah. And so the outline for this book, chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 8, are judgments that are prophesied. And then blessings prophesied in chapter 3, verse 9, through chapter 3, verse 20. Now, of course, we'll take this in the first two chapters together, so we're going to see a lot of judgment, but there is a promise of restoration as well. There is some blessing that's given. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, we see universal judgment. Zephaniah's prophecy begins with Yahweh declaring unequivocally that he will eventually judge the entire earth and everyone on it who remains in their wicked ways. We see that in verses 2 and 3. And note how this judgment is going to affect various elements of God's creation. Man, beast, birds, and fish will be cut off from the earth and sky and seas. That is eschatological language. And indeed, Zephaniah is going to speak much on the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. The prophecy then focuses more specifically on Jerusalem and the rest of Judah, with idolatry being the particularly grievous sin that God declares he'll judge his people for, verses 4 through 6. In chapter 1, verses 7 through 18, we get the day of Yahweh. God calls all who are hearing his message through Zephaniah to be silent and listen to this proclamation. The day of Yahweh is near. It approaches swiftly, and it's going to come upon Israel and Judah when they least expect it. Remember, that day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord, eschatological language referring to the end of this age, the end times that are yet to come. And we see it referenced here by Zephaniah several times, verses 7, 8, and 14 through 18. Now, though Yahweh's primary focus is on the coming day of judgment, on that day, the day of the Lord, he does turn his attention to judgment that Judah is going to experience in Zephaniah's near future. All of the sins that God calls the people out for in the final day of judgment were true of them when Zephaniah prophesied as well. This is especially true of the residents of Jerusalem who were guilty, of course, of that wickedness that was previously described, the idolatry from verses 4 through 6. They were also guilty of putting their trust in pagan nations, verse 8, desecrating the temple, verse 9, and committing violence and deceit towards their people, verses 9 and 13. Well, we get to chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and we actually get this hope spot. Here's a blessing, Yahweh's salvation. Even as the Lord has and will continue to proclaim righteous judgment on the wicked enemies of his people and on his own people, he still provides the way of hope, the way of salvation from such calamity. And Yahweh calls those peoples to not wait until his day of judgment comes upon them, rather to repent now before his burning anger fell upon them, verses 1 and two. Yahweh commands them to seek humility, seek righteousness, to seek God himself, and he may relent from his anger. Verse three. And then we get to the rest of chapter two, verses four through 15, judgment on the nations. The Lord systematically describes various enemy nation states and what he's going to do to them. So verses four through seven, he promises to obliterate all of the Philistines, all of their cities. Those ancient enemies of Israel, the Lord stated that he would make the coastlines which the Philistines dwelled in, such as Gaza, into pastures for the remnant of his people far down the road who are going to be preserved in the last day. Verses 8 through 11, God promises to destroy the Moabites and Ammonites, two other very ancient enemies of Israel. They had arrogantly taunted and attacked his people, stretching all the way back to their wilderness journeys in the time of the Exodus 
clear through Zephaniah's day. And the judgment on Moab and Ammon would be so severe that it's going to be as though the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah had fallen on them. And that to, is, is not just um, to heighten the sense of destruction, but remember, Moab and Ammon came from Lot, right? In that very horrid, uh, sinful manner with which his daughters treated him after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and their husbands had died in that, produced Moab and Ammon, from whom those nations are descended. And then verses 12 through 15, God promises destruction on both Ethiopia and Assyria, which he will blast to their foundations, desolating the lands that those once mighty nations dwelled in. When we really stop to think about it, how gracious our great God is. He makes the way of salvation known even as he proclaims judgment on those who have offended his holiness. He always holds out his loving hand to those who are broken and contrite of heart, who seek him in his righteous ways. And there will come a day in that day of the Lord, at that very end of all times, there's going to come a, a moment there where it's all judgment and that loving hand is no longer held out. But right now he is still holding out that loving hand. And he still graciously holds out Israel's hope as well. I mean, God already came to dwell among them when Jesus, the Son of God, was born and lived ministered, died on the cross, and was resurrected. In Romans 11, 25 through 25-29, Paul says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. May you and I not harden our hearts against Christ as Israel did. May we trust in him and forsake our sins. And may we proclaim the gospel to everyone and pray that God's chosen people, Israel, will finally, that that remnant would appear and to finally repent and believe in Jesus. This has been Zephaniah chapters 1 and 2, and I hope you have a great day.